right, all right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of A Fresh Perspective with Jeff Charles, where we prefer truth over narrative and principles over politics. And I, I've got another great guest for you guys today. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this, even though the subject matter is, is pretty dark. But we're going to talk about some very important things in, in this episode. Um, but before we, uh, before I bring my guest on, just want to remind you to like this. You got to share this and subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. That way you'll be uh, notified whenever I upload a new episode or a new interview. Also, if you haven't already, check out my Substack. It's called Chasing Liberty. You can access that at libertychasers.com. Become a subscriber. Become a paid subscriber. I really appreciate it. Uh, all, all of your help and contributions help keep me going. Now, what we're going to be talking about today, some of you might have, might have heard of this uh, monster named Joseph Mengele, who was a part of the Third Reich. He was a, uh, uh, he was a, a doctor who did a lot of different experiments on people during the Holocaust in the, uh, ho in the concentration camp in Auschwitz. I'm bringing on with me the author of Hiding Mengele, How a Nazi Network Harbored the Angel of Death. I have been reading this. I am almost done with it. And it is a fascinating read. It comes out on October 1st. So you've got to get this book. It's tells a different type of story about Mengele, about specifically how he was hidden after the Third Reich fell. So I have with me Miss Bettina Antone. Welcome to the program. Hello, Jeff. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, this book is disturbing and fascinating. Um, there's so much in it, and you have actually have a kind of a personal connection to the subject matter. But before we get into that, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, all that good stuff? Okay, let's start like that. So I'm a journalist for the last 20 years, more than 20 years. I work for Brazilian television, Global TV, which is the largest TV channel here in Latin America. I'm also a commentator for Global News, which is an all-news channel. Uh, my field is uh, international politics mostly, but I also have a master's degree in international history from the London School of Economics. I like history so much, and I always wanted to write something that got my both fields, journalism and history. So that's why this book. Great, great. This is, this is awesome. So I want to understand... What made you want to write this book in the first place? Yes, as I told you, I love these both fields, but I had a personal connection to this subject, uh, Josef Mengele. When I was, I'm from the German community here in Sao Paulo. My, my family came from Germany, from both sides from my mother's side and my father's side. And I went to a German school here in Sao Paulo, uh, where I live. Mm -hmm. And when I was six years old, my teacher, Lizelotte Bossert, she suddenly was expelled from school. She disappeared, no one knew about her. And then we just, as a, as a kid, I only heard the name Mengele, Mengele, Mengele. And I knew that something very bad had happened with her and that she did something very bad, but I didn't know what she did. And I also thought that Mengele must have been someone evil because every all the adults were talking about him. And then later I found out that Mengele was the, the Nazi doctor, like the symbol of Auschwitz and Auschwitz is the symbol of Holocaust. And that my school teacher harbored Mengele here in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And also she had an important part in his story, in his story because she was the person that buried Mengele under a false name here in Brazil in 1979. So all the authorities all over the world, even the US, they took another six years to find, to find out that he was already dead. And this was my teacher. That was it's, she was your teacher. So you had a teacher who harbored a Nazi war criminal. Can you describe to me what it felt like when you finally found that out? Actually, I was a kid. I was small. I was six years old. But this feeling, I got um, a, 
a big feeling towards this all the story because I could feel that that she did something bad. I could feel that that something uh, wasn't right there because of the talk in the school because this was a big scandal. Even uh, um, an American TV went to my school and filmed us as children, and many parents were very worried. To, they were saying like, "Oh my God, my my children will be will be portrayed in the U.S. as Nazi children and so on." So this was a big scandal back in the nineties, the eighties. Uh, sorry. So I I always had the feeling, but I didn't know exactly what she did, and and not even what Mengele did. I could I could watch on television here in Brazil. I think in the U.S. as well. I think no, I'm sure that in the US as well, many reports in the 80s telling about these crazy doctors that did many, many horrible experiments with children, uh, suing children together and doing a lot of experiments, uh, taking out the eyes of, of children and women and so on. Uh, so I always wanted to, to, to know in more detail and also to... Um, to have to be based on research of what re he really did and what she really did. Mm. That's why I started to write the book and to investigate the story. Was there anything specific? Because I mean, okay, so you find out that your teacher was uh, was a uh, uh, Liza Lota Bossard who helped her and her husband uh, help to hide Joseph Mengele from the Nazi hunters. Uh, so you probably knew that for a little while before you decided to launch this investigation. What was it that made you say, you know what, I need to investigate this? You know, was it just one thing or was it just a culmination of things that finally motivated you to look into this? Actually, uh, what triggered me was this uh, childhood story that I wanted to tell. So I started reading everything that was written about this case. And then I also made a, a trip, a, a professional trip to Israel. So I met a, a Mossad commander, the same guy that he had kidnapped and was the commander at Eichmann, uh, kidnapping in the, in the 60s from Argentina to Jerusalem. This case is very, very famous. Uh, Hannah Arendt wrote a book on this. So the same guy was came here to Brazil in the 60s after Eichmann and was supposed to kidnap Mengele as well. They wanted Mossad, uh, the Israeli agency, wanted to, to do the same thing that they did with, with Eichmann. They wanted to do it with Mengele. So uh, I interviewed him and I got a, a, ver a very good interview. He told me m many things that I didn't know, that I didn't read anywhere else. So, and then I didn't, uh, at this point, I didn't talk to Lisa Lotta yet because I couldn't, I, I didn't know where she was. She simply disappeared. So, and I was asking all the teachers from the school that, that were teachers at the school in the eighties. And then uh, nobody knew anything about her. So finally I got to her uh, via the, the school director uh, and he told me, yes, she's still alive. I saw her uh, one day and then I went to her house to speak to her because she wouldn't answer the phone. And this was a big surprise for me. <laughs> you read the book, you already know it. Yes. Yeah. But, but here, here's, so here's a question. Um, you know, well, actually, before I get to that, can you kind of, you don't have to go into too much detail, but for, just for those who may not be familiar with Joseph Mengele, can you kind of describe why this man is so evil and some of the things that he did while he was serving in Auschwitz? Yes, sure. Uh, Mengele was a doctor in, in, in Auschwitz. He served the SS, the, the special elite group in, the, in Nazism. And he had two functions in, in Auschwitz. First, he had to choose the prisoner that should go to the gas chamber and the ones that could still work. But Mengele appeared much more uh, on the platform, as they call it, the Rampe in German, because he, was, he wanted to find people to be 
his guinea pigs in, in his experiments. So he went to work much more often than other doctors. That's why he became so famous after the war, because many prisoners could recognize Mengele because he was always there. He was always working and he was he was after uh, twins in the first place because twins were um, the subject of, of research in the genetic field at this time. If you wanted to study genetics in Germany, not only in Auschwitz, uh, studying twins was an important, important part to do this. And he was also uh, after dwarfs, for example, people that had congenital problems, uh, giants, uh, all kinds of abnormalities. So uh, that, that's why he worked so much on the ramp. And he also had his work as a researcher in Auschwitz, doing his own research, uh, mostly on, on twins. And people, as I say in the book, he did like a, a, his own concentration camp of twins inside the concentration camp because he could gather like hundreds of twins. And he made experiments on people without caring about if they would would be hurt or or if if they would die anything he didn't care about anything so and he did many creepy experiments on people like that's why he became famous as a cruel uh person and he's one symbol of Auschwitz and one big symbol of the holocaust yeah, I mean, especially in your book, and you can read about it elsewhere as well, but in your book, you go into a lot of detail about some of these experiments, and they sound like the type of thing that you would see in a movie about a serial killer. It's very horrible, just dark stuff. And and what I what I quite what I, I mean, you kind of explain it, but what was the reason for these experiments? Like why what what was even the purpose of him doing these things? Well, we have to to keep in mind that. Uh, although he was very cruel and he was kind of psychopath, <laughs> don't know if you can say this like um, literally, but he had two PhD degrees. He was a very, he had a high culture. He was not just kind of crazy person and pseudo scientist, as many people say, said about him. No, he was a real scientist. The problem is, what the problem was the philosophy of the Third Reich. And the philosophy was to prove that the German race and the Aryan race, of course, was above other races. So one of the objectives of his studies was to prove this, that that uh, Aryan race was superior um, in comparison to other, others. Uh, and also in comparison to, to Jewish people. He wanted to prove that Jewish people were, were degenerate, that the Jewish race was degenerate. So that's that's one of, of, of his purposes. And he also had, like, he was, uh, he wanted to build his career in Nazi Germany in the Third Reich. He wanted to be a professor after the war ended. And he thought doing a lot of research, he could, he could have a good position after war. So that's why he did so many bad things, but these things were inside an uh, ideology. That's why I always say we have to be very careful with this evil ideology. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, because when you think of people doing these things, like I said, you think of like Hannibal Lecter, you think of like the serial killer on the movies. But in this case, it was ideology that drove him. It wasn't necessarily like, oh, I just want to cut people up or I want to do these experiments. I mean, obviously he did, but it, it was this, this ideology and this need to uh, to appeal to this ideology that he bought into, almost like a cult. Exactly. That's the point. He went to some of the best universities in, in Germany. He went to university in Munich. He went to university in Frankfurt. Like and and he did um, some work in Berlin in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which is now Max Planck Institute. After the war, changed name, the name. So you see, uh, he did go to some 
very well-known universities, and he was a guy that was inside the system. He was not kind of of crazy guy, a part of everything. No, he was inside the system, and that's very creepy. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, very, very much so. You know, there was one part of, of the book that was talking about uh, his experiments and, and everything surrounding that. And there's this one patch that really struck me. You wrote, you wrote, um, according to the Third Reich regulations, testing on humans was not forbidden. What was prohibited by a 1933 law was the use of animals in surgeries or treatments that could cause pain or injury. So under the Third Reich, under the Nazi regime, you could not experiment on animals. And regardless of how people feel about that, it's very interesting that it, that Nazi Germany said you can't operate on animals, but on humans, have at it. It's perfectly fine. Exactly. And Mengele did a lot of experiments on people in Auschwitz, uh, disregarding if they had pain or anything, because he thought they are going to be killed anyway because uh, Hitler and also the Wannsee um, Convention in 1942 had already decided about the final solution of the Jewish people. The final solution is a, like a, a name to, to say that they were going to kill all the Jews. Mm -hmm. So if they were going to be killed, I'm going to experiment on them before they're being killed. That's, that's what, that was his rationale. Yeah, basically, I might as well get as much use from these people as I can because they're all going to go off to the gas chambers anyway. But when it comes, I don't know if you came across this in your research about how the difference between like uh, operating on animals and operating on humans. How did the Nazi regime justify this? Like saying it's okay to to do these experiments and to operate on human beings, but not on animals. Do you know what, what how they argued that? Like, what, how would they even, I, I don't know, convince people that that's okay? The, the ideology was simply that um, there were a master race, okay, according to them, to be very clear. There was a master race, which was the Aryans, and there were some other sub-races that weren't even worth, like, even worth of living, well, not just the Jews. Uh, the, the Nazis had a plan to exterminate all people from Eastern countries as well when they were conquering uh, territories in the Soviet Union and so on. The Slavs, for example, they wanted to, them to, to work until they, they, they die of exhaustion. And so that's why the thing, they like, uh, Nazis liked the animals very much, but they didn't like the other people from other races. So that, that was their thinking. It's, I know it's it's extreme, but this happened less than 100 years ago. It's and in a in a country that was very civilized. That's the most shocking thing. Like Germany had how many Nobel Peace Prizes? You know, no, not Nobel Peace Prizes, uh, Nobel Prizes. A lot of them in chemistry, physics, and so on. They were very clever people, and they had this this ideology. So this is something that we really have to to think about. And they do this in Germany. They had a lot of programs nowadays to reflect on their past. This memory culture is very strong in Germany. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you have something like that happen in the country, and you do everything you can to move past it. And you're right, it, it's less than 100 years ago, there were people who were still alive today that lived through that. It, it's just, it's, 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 it's crazy. Um, so I, I want to talk about how Mengele evaded capture. So the Third Reich falls, the Soviet Union comes in, they start liberating these camps, the Allies come in from, from the West, start liberating these camps, and he slips out. Can you kind of describe how that happened? Yes, sure. Uh, it was a, he had a long run because he spent like 34 years uh, as a fugit fugitive, uh, most of, of almost 20 years here in Brazil. Okay, so here, very close to where I live. So this is also very intriguing for me. And nowadays I, I go to places uh, where, where he used to go, for example, the German bookstore, very close to my house and so on. And I know that, that, that he was there. But uh, Mengele, escaped Auschwitz before the Soviets came. So 
He left Auschwitz in January 1945 because he knew the Soviets were coming and he went to the to other concentration camps towards Germany. But they were the Soviets were coming, the Red Army was coming. So he got to a a, a camp, a, a hospital, field hospital, and he had a friend there. And of course, he took off his SS uniform and took a Wehrmacht uniform, the, the, the army, the regular army, because he knew being part of the SS was already something very bad and he would go to prison. And so for the first weeks after, after Auschwitz was uh, released, he spent in uh, this hospital, a field camp hospital, um, because he had a friend there, but he couldn't spend so much time there. So he went to Germany. There he was in a uh, prisoner of war. Uh, he was captured by the Americans, yeah. but he escaped the, the, these two camps and he lived for almost three, three years uh, close to his city in Günzburg in, in, in Bavaria, southern Germany. And then he thought, I cannot stay here because there's this denazification de process and so on. I have to escape. And there, there was a very well-known route to South America, to Argentina. And in Argentina, the president was Perón. Mm -hmm. And Perón was an enthusiast of fascism. And he welcomed the Nazis because he knew the Nazis could bring him some know-how, and so on. So Mengele went to live in Argentina and he spent 10 years there. But in 1959, Germany had the first uh, pre pre warrant against him. So he fled to Paraguay. And in 1960, the year that Eichmann was kidnapped in Buenos Aires, he got too afraid of Mossad. And then he, he thought, I cannot stay here in Paraguay anymore. And so he decided to come to Brazil. And here he spent 18 years. And he died here in Bertioga, a beach where like three hours from where, two hours from where I live. And he 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 died there swimming with his friends. <laughs> and wow. my teacher, of course, Lizzie Lotta, she was there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, she was there. She witnessed the whole thing. I mean, he had become kind of like a, an uncle to the family. And, but, but before I, we get into that, cause that part like really rocked my mind, just the people who harbored him. <laughs> he didn't escape Germany on his own, right? He had help. So in your book, you describe this entire network that helped him get out, helped him travel around, evade the authorities. Can you describe this, this network to us? Yeah, there was, yes, there was some kind of network that could protect him. Like for example, he had, um, uh, a fake Red Cross passport, and that's why why people in the the post war didn't ask so much about uh, people's origins because there were there were lots and lots of refugees, and they were they were coming here to Latin America, to Brazil, and to Argentina. So uh, Mengele took one of these boats leaving from Italy. But to go to Italy, he had to pass a lot of small towns in, in, in Italy and also Austria and south of Germany. And to do that, he had to have a lot of money to pay people and people to guide him and so on. So, But when he arrived in, in Buenos Aires, he already he made contact with a lot of Nazis and these Nazis uh, helped him a lot. And they were like high profile Nazis, not just like regular Nazi voter. No, there were people that were high in the hierarchy. For example, uh, Eichmann, but also Hans Ulrich Huden, which was uh, a pilot, uh, the best pilot in Hitler's Air Force. And he was here in Buenos Aires, good friends with Peron. And also other Nazis like Willem Sassen, was an SS officer, a Dutch SS officer. He was he was Dutch, but he fought for the SS. And there were other other guys here in in Buenos Aires. I went to Buenos Aires to do some research and photograph the houses, and it was amazing. Like they they met in in some kind of mansions, and you could still imagine like this all these people meeting 
and having parties, I don't know, and exchanging ideas and in Buenos Aires after the war. <laughs> It's just it's just wild because I mean in, in your book and and I knew that a lot of Nazis went to South America, Argentina, Brazil, and other places. What I didn't know is that they had like entire German communities, not all Nazis, of course, just regular German folks, <laughs> you know, in in Brazil that yeah. you know, you go there speak German and you're basically like living among Germans in South America. Um, it's, it, it, I, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that that was th that prevalent. Uh, did the so did the Brazilian government have anything to do with hiding him, or did they just did they not know? Or I didn't find any proof that uh, Brazilian authorities knew that Mengele was here in Brazil. But uh, yes, I think this is something maybe people in the U.S. or in Europe don't know so well that. Here in Brazil, especially here in Sao Paulo, we have um, a big Germany, a German community, and I'm part of this community. You know, I go to the Lutheran church since I was a kid. My father worked for a German, German company, so I spoke German. I thought uh, until I, I went to, to college, I thought everybody in Brazil spoke German as a second language. You know? <laughs> I lived in a bubble. So, and this... This happens here. We have a lot of, not a lot, but some uh, German schools here and a lot of German families of, of German descent and so on. So Mengele could mix in very easily here. It's not, it was not like, oh my God, look at this German guy. No, it was common. It was common. And I even found out that Mengele went to my school once and uh -huh. he was presented to the director. <laughs> Yes, this is creepy. And he was presented to, to school director. Uh, Lisa Lotte presented him. And uh, she, she said that was someone from, from her family, an uncle and so on. But the the director didn't say anything. It was so common to have an uncle from Germany, an uncle from Austria or, or Switzerland. This was something very natural. People could speak German here in Sao Paulo. This neighborhood, like... Santa, Santo Amaro, where I live, like there are lots of Germans uh, until today. So this was something that was not uh, like would call attention, you know. But the thing is, uh, what I wanted to know in my research was being part of the German community and my teacher uh, who has harbored him, who has protected him, was my community like a nest of Nazis? This is something that I really wanted to know. And so I went after the teachers, the director, uh, like uh, also the parents from that time, my friend's parents, by the way. And I talked to a lot of people. And I even found out a woman who was Jewish and she didn't tell anyone that she was Jewish because she was so afraid. Her mother went to Auschwitz. Her grandparents died in Auschwitz. So she didn't tell anyone because she was so afraid. She thought she's German, by the way. She thought like, uh, if I say to anyone that I'm, I'm Jew, they, I, I will have, they will have prejudice against me or something like that. And then I thought this person, this woman is the best person I could ask if uh, if there was some kind of anti-Semitism or something like that in my school. And she said, not at all. Like she said that she felt very well at school and she didn't go out of school. The only, the only point that she thought she was going to take uh, her kids out of school was when she found out that he, Lizelotte, her children's, a uh, teacher was protecting Mengele, but she didn't. She didn't need to take them out because she she was expelled from school right away, so she didn't have to bother. So she was really relieved because she felt very well at the school. So there was no talk about uh, nazism, uh, like the opposite. We had to to um, to learn about this at school much more than other Brazilian kids. Wow. I, so yeah, so a, a Jewish woman had her mm -hmm. child in the school that where a teacher who was hiding a Nazi was. Wow, that's just that blows my mind. I can't even. 
-hmm. not a regular Nazi, not a regular Nazi, the Nazi that sent uh, her grandparents to the guest chamber in Auschwitz. Mm. So when she heard the name Joseph Mengele, they were, she and her mother, because her mother went to Auschwitz, her mother couldn't believe it. Like she was completely crazy about this. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So so what about the people who helped Mengele who weren't Nazis? Like these are little, the, the Bossert family were not Nazis necessarily. And I know there were other civilians who helped them too. Uh, you know, like, I don't understand why, how do they rationalize this? Like, did, how much did they know about what he did for, that's the first question I want to ask. Yes, I think this is like a complicated, not complicated question. It's like um, a set answer, let's say, let's say so. For example, Lisa Lotte, when I talked to her, she said, you know, he's a scientist. He didn't do all these things that they say he, de he did and so on. He wanted so much to believe that he was a uh, scientist. And then I asked her, do you know this by reading books or do you know this by, by him telling you? And then she told me, I know from both. So, of course, uh, he did many, many bad things. This is very, very well documented. Like, uh, no one is making up anything because you have so many people talking about what he did. It's impossible to, to, to not believe it. You know, so many people from so many different nationalities talking about all the things he did. So if she didn't um, believe it, it was because maybe he, she identified herself with, with the ideology. I don't know. Her husband, I think he, yes, he was a Nazi because he was very close friends to Mengele. And he was also close friends to Wolfgang Gerhardt. This is a not. This is a. This is a Nazi, like a fan fanatical Nazi. And Wolfgang Gerhardt, I have to introduce him, was an, an Austrian guy who lived here in São Paulo. He, and he was the guy that received Mengele the first that first received Mengele in Brazil in 19, 1960. Okay. And he was so much fanatical that he put like a swastika on the top of his Christmas tree. And he had a son called Adolf. So that was the kind of the guy, you know. But he couldn't keep Mengele living at his house because he, he wasn't so well off. And he, got, he, he had four children. But he was all the time uh, supporting Mengele as, as good as he could. And there was also the, this other family, this Hungarian family, that kept like uh, Mengele for uh, 13 years. And they weren't uh, uh, Nazis. This Hungarian family, I think they weren't Nazis. They were escaping communism in, in, in Hungary. And they lived here in Brazil. They liked the climate and so on. And they, they, there was also a Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian community here in, in Sao Paulo. So they, but I found out that they had like uh, financial connections. You know, they bought a little farm together with Mengele. Mengele family gave money to Mengele so they could buy this little house, this little farm. Mengele had an apartment here in, in Sao Paulo. So this, this Hungarian uh, guy could sell his property. And I also took the documents from the, um, the house that Mengele lived uh, in his last days. And this house was on the name of the Hungarian family. And later they passed it to the Bossards. So they had like a financial connection. So money played also a role in this story, not only ideology, not only friendship, but also money. Yeah, it always comes back to money. <laughs> um, so- <laughs> So what can you tell me about the Bossert family in, in, in general? I mean, they lived in Sao Paulo and then, you know, Mengele comes along and I know at first they didn't really know who he was, but what, what was kind of their dynamic with the husband and wife and the kids? Uh, I, sorry. Uh, what were you asking about the Bossarts? Yes. Yeah. The Bossarts. Can, can you just kind of tell me about the family? Okay. 
you know, uh, in my yes, of course, I could. Uh, I did talk to Lisa Lottin. I talked to the to the children as well, but they didn't want to to speak about it. But I have a lot of information from letters that Mengele wrote and also that he received while he was here in Brazil in the seventies. They were forgotten in a, in the Federal Police Museum in Brasilia. I went there and I read them all and translated them. There were over 80 letters wow. left here and also a lot of pictures. So it's amazing. Like in the letters, you you find out that Mengelin used to go to, with this family very often to to the beach, for example, they uh, also for this little farm close to São Paulo, uh, called this place called Itapecerica da Serra. And there uh, he used to go to waterfalls. They, they, he played with the kids. He was called the uncle. Uh, he went, uh, he, he liked, liked growing uh, plants and flowers. He loved very much Bra Brazilian nature. Like uh, he describes the nature here in São Paulo in our in our region, which is called Mata Atlântica. He even adopts some Brazilian words, very specific. Uh, I, I, we speak Portuguese, but this this some some words that are very much Brazilian, uh, like name of of birds and so on, so on. And it's very funny to see him writing in Germany German, and then uh, suddenly. Uh, a, a Portuguese word appears, you know, <laughs> and yes, they were very close. They didn't live in the same house, and but they they kept uh, close. And every uh, every Wednesday, Wolfram Bossert went to Mengele's house so he could have dinner together. And Mengele appreciated very much speaking in German, and also discussing lots of subjects. He he liked to discuss culture, medicine, uh, astrology, all kinds of subjects. He liked talking to people mostly in German. That's why uh, he didn't like so much. He, he liked the company but from Brazilians, but the Brazilians he knew, like his neighbors, also he, his maids and so on. He couldn't talk to them like um, about high culture and so on. They didn't have this high culture. You know, they were uh, simple people from the periphery here in in, in Sao Paulo. Yeah, that, that makes sense. He was very educated. He had, you know, multiple degrees. I mean, it would make sense that he would want some company of, of, of that caliber. Uh, what happened to the Bossert family after Mangala passed away and after it was discovered that they were harboring it? You know, they had to go to the police many, many times and press uh, to, they were investigated and we have this recorded. I have all, all the, you know, don't say interviews, like when they talk to the police, I have all the records about that. And then uh, from that, I could, I could find many things because I couldn't speak to Rolf Wolfram because he, he died many years ago. So I could find out many things about Mengele from these interviews to the police and also from newspaper interviews also in Portuguese. So um, basically, Lisa Lotto went out of school and it's it's very weird because she, she suddenly disappeared. No one knew in the community where she was. And um, but they had to to answer uh, about these crimes. It passed so much time that they they the law like they they couldn't be prosecuted. They were prosecuted, but they couldn't be condemned anymore. You know, like because the time passed so so much time passed. It was already in the ni the nineties that they the the final sentence came so they didn't go to jail nothing happened to them wow yeah, it's kind of like the statute of limitations in america for certain crimes if a certain amount of time passes exactly somebody for yeah. exactly i can now i can't remember were you ever able to speak with rolf mengala uh, joseph mengala's son sorry can you repeat this yeah, so were you able to speak with Rolf Mengele? I think his name was Joseph Mengele's son. 
No, uh, Rolf Mengele doesn't give interviews since like he had to give his DNA to to prove that the skeleton that was found here close to São Paulo was his father, his father's. Uh, but he gave uh, some interviews to the German press in the 80s and 90s. So in the, the 80s, I think. Yes, in the 80s. So I took a lot of information uh, from the time that he gave an interview, for example, for Punta magazine, which is a big German magazine. So from there, I could um, know what he thought. And also from letters that, that he wrote to his father, and that his father wrote to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to talk about Mengele's life on the run in in Brazil. Um, you know, can you describe kind of may maybe his psychological state during his time while he was a fugitive? I mean, obviously, he would hang out with the Bossards. He would, you know, have conversations. He had friends. But, you know, what, was there any paranoia or regret? Or can, can you just kind of talk about his 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 mindset throughout all this? Yes, he was uh, really afraid of being caught by the Israelis. Like he wasn't so much afraid of being caught uh, by by the, the German justice because his family was well off, and the pay the police in 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 Günzburg, the the city where he he comes from. But he was afraid of Mossad, and he saw what happened to Eichmann. And he was very much afraid that something similar could happen, happen to him. He was not wrong because Mossad got really close to him here in Sao Paulo. And here, when he lived in some cities, he didn't live just in, in Sao Paulo, in the suburbs, but he lived in some rural uh, areas, like uh, in Serra Negra, for example, is in, on the countryside of Sao Paulo State, always in Sao Paulo State, where, where he used to live. And he used to walk around with a lot of dogs. So he built a tower. And from there, he could see if anyone was coming, he could see from there. So he got the paranoia that he was going to be caught from, from the, 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 the Israelis would ca caught him. And that's what he he said. And also Wolfram said, and also Lizelotte said, everybody said that, that he was really paranoid of being caught. and also. He was, he had, he was, sometimes he was sad. Uh, and this is something that I think Rolf tried to, to do in his interviews in the, in the 80s, but I don't agree with him. Like he tried to portray his father as a very sad man that had a miserable life here in Brazil. But reading his letters, and seeing his pictures, I have another view of this, you know, because you cannot be uh, very miserable and depressed if you go to the beach, if you go to waterfalls, if you read your books, if you see your friends. Like, I don't, I cannot see that. And he had some small pleasures. He had dogs here in Sao Paulo. He had nicknames for his dogs. He, he tells about, like, going out for uh, taking some berries, he did some he he had some some small pleasures you know he he liked to go to the german bookstore uh, and afterwards he liked to eat some some uh german sweets and so on that that he had available here in, in brazil here in sao paulo so i cannot see him as depressed but i can see him as someone that was really afraid of not having love in, in the end of his life because you know the brazilian people uh did they didn't know who he was only his european friends knew who he really was so he was afraid of that of not not having like affectionate relationships but it didn't happen any anyways because as he died he died in the arms of his friends wolfram almost died trying to save him so he didn't he didn't die without love and this is something very crazy as well it's disturbing because i mean you want him to die disturbing badly. yes yeah like you want him to die badly yeah. you want him to get captured and hung and strung up and all that i mean it's 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 just it blows my mind I, was there ever any point where he may have 
indicated at least some level of remorse or did he always believe in what he was doing or unfortunately not and that's something i i say here like some sometimes that i i do some talks uh, even in a synagogue I went uh, two weeks ago unfortunately he did not regret anything and more than that he showed like he showed that his his prejudice his racism was not just against Jews uh, here in Brazil he had contact with a lot of black people and he showed like his racism and prejudice against black people here in Brazil so um, no, he didn't regret anything. Unfortunately, that's not what we I wanted to read in his letters. He like oh my, I, what I was expecting to read, what I wanted to read, like oh my God, what I did to this little girl in Auschwitz, I cannot sleep, or so on and so forth. But he didn't say anything like that. He didn't even mention it. Yeah, so that was going to be my, my next question. I mean, did he ever have conversations with other people about his previous life? Or did he really just keep that close to the vest? Or uh, That's interesting. Because, for example, when uh, Rolf came to Brazil to meet his father in 1977, Rolf was determined to find out what his father really did in, in, in Auschwitz. And we have to keep in mind that Rolf is from another generation, a generation that has another thought on, on Germany and so on. But uh, Mengele was really distressed by his questions, you know. And this is something interesting about this visit because we have Rolf's side um, like he told the Bunta magazine. And we also have Mengele's side on this visit because Mengele wrote this on his letters. And Mengele said that, okay, I know there are many points that, that may make my, my son um, like distressed. So I'm, I know we have some very different political views. Uh, so I don't mention them. I prefer not to talk about them with him. And also with his friends, we, we see that he talked about the war sometimes, but I don't think he he would talk about Auschwitz. He doesn't mention it. Mm -hmm. But he, he he did talk about war. Yes, and, and poli politics. Yes, the, the friends talked about it. He, he even commented something about uh, the Kennedys and so on. Yes, he was... He was up to date in the news. Wow. So he, he kept up with what was going on in the world. Wow. Uh, so yes. And let me tell you something that I think it's very funny. He he loved Brazilian soap operas. Like he, he watched all of them. Like he, he started at six o'clock in the afternoon and then he watched the seven o'clock and also the eight o'clock. So this is this is so funny for me. A guy like him, like a, an assassin, like a murderer. And he, he loved watching soap operas. He didn't miss one. That is just crazy. And, you know, it, but what's crazy about it is it's, it's kind of scary because you don't want to think of these people I mean, because they're monsters. So you want to see them as monsters. Monsters don't just sit around watching yes. soap operas. They don't, you know, go to college and get educated and become scientists. If you look, when you look at Joseph Mengele's picture, he looks like a regular guy. He looks just like a regular young German person in the military. If you didn't know what this guy did, there would be no clue. We always expect monsters to look like monsters and to act like monsters, but they don't always do that. A lot of times they're just very normal people. Yes, and that's very confusing. That's why I think maybe Lizelotti couldn't say like that on couldn't betray him and tell the authorities that he was in Brazil. So many people would would be so grateful if she did that, you know, because he didn't pay for his crimes and he died without paying for any crimes. And Lisa Lotti could have done this. He, she could have told the, poli the police and, and even a survivor from Auschwitz that knew like a Polish woman that was in Serra Negra, the same city where Mengele used to live in the, on the countryside. She said that she knew that she found out that he was there. But instead of going to the police, she was completely afraid. And she went away from, from Serra Negra. And, 
and she promised never to go back because she thought that Mengele was there to kill all the Jews. She was so traumatized that she couldn't even think like, like uh, wisely because she could have done this. She could have gone to the police and tell them. But on the other hand, there's also a big problem. Mengele, I think, was the guy that was involved in, in, in like uh, in most fake news stories ever because everybody thought that they could have seen Mengele somewhere, not here in Brazil, but uh, in Paraguay, for example, uh, in Argentina, and many places, many other places. You know, there were some some people that said that I saw Mengele. In, in, even in Patagonia, Bariloche. Bariloche, Bariloche I think he, he went there. There is no proof, but I think he went there. But many other places, people say that he was, even when he was already dead, for six years, people kept saying that they, they saw Mengele. How how is it possible? Yeah. So so I mean, with, with the bosses like Liz Alote in in particular, did she ever express any remorse? I mean, you talk about when you met her face to face, and that conversation was very weird <laughs> to say the least. Did she ever express exactly? Yeah. Did she ever express any kind of remorse for her, for hiding him? No, she thought that she did a good thing. She thought that she followed her heart and that he was a good friend of her. She was a, he was a friend of the family and that she didn't do anything wrong. And she said that some people say something, the other people say other things. So she think she thought what she thought and she thought that she didn't do anything wrong. Um. So that that was what was her mindset? Let's see. So, I'm trying to find anything positive about this story, and I can't. <laughs> yes, but there is, you know, something like, for example, something that's uh, really strong for me was the activism of the the twins, and there was this woman, Eva Moses Kaur, who who was an uh, American, and I I interviewed her, but she she. She passed away, unfortunately, during the process of the book. I, actually, many people passed away while I was writing the book because they were already, they had uh, like old age. And she managed in the 80s to find more than 100 Mengele twins. Mm. And they put them all together at a time that they didn't have WhatsApp, internet whatsoever. So, um. Because of her, I think uh, the authorities decided at last to go after Mengele in the 1980s because she she organized a mock trial in Jerusalem in 1985 uh, uh, commemorating the 40 years of liberation of Auschwitz. And she wanted to know so badly what Mengele did to the twins because many had health problems until the end of their lives. And... They, did, they didn't know why. And they wanted to know what they were injected into. Like, what 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 kind of thing did you do to me? So right. that's why they wanted to meet Mengele so, so badly. Not just to have justice, this of course, but also to know what had happened to them. And so I know, I think this this force inside this, this woman, it's like a very big inspiration for me, you know? Everything that she went through Auschwitz as, when she was uh, 10 years old and she decided to leave. And then like afterwards, uh, all her story, trying to, to find the, the, the twins and trying to save her sister because her sister had a very bad kidney problem. And then she organized this mock trial in Jerusalem and then was this world commotion uh, to find Mengele. And then after more or less four months, finally, they found out, the, the German police found out that Mengele was buried here in Sao Paulo, here in Brazil. That's, that's how it happened. Yeah, and, you know, and without those, those, those people being willing to get together, the twins and everybody else who spoke out, I mean, we might not have known how bad this was. We might not have known exactly what Mengele did. And to really look into what 
evil looks like. So that is, that is a, that is a silver lining. That that is something positive to take away from it. Um, I did want to find out though, why didn't they catch him? I mean, they caught Eichmann. They caught a lot of others. But he had the U.S. looking after him. He had Germany looking for him. The Mossad. I mean, the Mossad couldn't find him. How did he keep getting away? Yeah, uh, of of course, he had a lot of luck, but also he had money from his family. And also, I think the most important thing, he was always one step ahead of his persecutors because he was very clever and he was determined not to be kept caught. So he was always, even in his last months of life, he was like, um, it's he was um, discussing with his family, for example, that was very, very dangerous to change houses because someone could see him, could recognize him. If you change anything, you can be in danger. So he was calculating everything until his last days. So I think that's why he, he wasn't caught, because he was so careful and he didn't want to be caught. And he was always one step ahead. So let me ask you this. And this is kind of like the, the final round of questions here. I, I wanted to because I'm in America. I don't know how much you follow American politics. Things are crazy right now. A lot. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> yes, I know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, I'd imagine they're probably crazy in Brazil too, but for people like, like you and I, for regular folks, especially when it comes to politics and ideology and all these things that are happening, all the tension, all the division, what does this, what can this story teach people like us who are living in these times right now? I think it can bring a lot of reflections as it did to me, for example. For example, I think we have to be very grateful and not take for granted, like, for example, the demo democratic institutions, because uh, these institutions, they can um, stop some crazy people, you know, if you don't have them, if you don't have these check and balances, then so society is lost. And sometimes we, we take them for granted. Also, the, jour the journalism is also very important. It's also the fourth power. So I think everything, the discussions and everything is so important to keep democracy going on. And that we, we don't ideology. If someone comes up with a crazy ideology uh, saying to kill people or to, to, that someone is better than others, I think we have to stop these people. You know, we have to value life. We have to value human life. We have to value. We we have to share some 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 values that are very important. You know, like like as I said, democracy, human life. And now we have this problem with migration. I know this is a huge issue in the United States right now, and maybe people should should start discussing a little bit this subject in a more human fashion, perhaps, and keep keeping in mind. I know it's a huge problem, it's an important problem, and but it's a problem of our time. And I don't know, I think we have to be humans. And at this time, people forgot how to be humans. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I have this, this, this feeling. <laughs> so I really hope that people that read this book could talk to each other, and reflect on issues and also bring this these issues that that happened uh some years ago and try to to make parallels to to what what we live today you know i think this is the bottom line like let's be humans let's discuss things let's don't take for granted the good things that we have yeah. And I like that what you just said there, you know, we've forgotten how to be human. I think especially in American politics, we have lost a lot of our humanity. And it's kind of terrifying to me because, you know, you have Republican, Democrat and everything in between. And, you know, somewhere along the line, like there's people, you know, in position, positions of power who want us to forget that we're human. They want us to see each other as the other or as the enemy. That's exactly what led to what Mengele did. He didn't see those people as human. I mean, we just talked earlier about how it was okay to operate on human beings, but not on animals. That right there is a sign that your society has lost its sense of humanity. And I think that if there's anything that you get out of this book, which again, y'all need to read this, you, you need to read this. 
this is what happens when we lose our humanity. I mean, does that, does that make does that make sense? Exactly, and we have to be careful. Like with that, we we it's like uh, something that we we have to reflect on, to think about. Um, some bad things can happen, you know, and they they don't they don't happen at once. They happen step by step. So we have to stop the steps like when they are in the beginning. That's what I think. <laughs> Most definitely. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I mean, this this book is amazing. I can't wait to finish it. I'm already blasting it out on social media because I want everybody to read this book. Um, but uh, but before we sign off, why don't you let everybody know where they can find you, where they can read your work, where they can see what you're doing, and also where they can get your book? Yeah, of course. The book will be released in the U.S. Um, October 1st. You can find it in bookstores and online and everywhere you can buy books. And also you can find me on Instagram, for example, Bettina underline Anton. Uh, Bettina is B-E-T-I-N-A underline A-N-T-O-N. You can find me there. This book was released also in some other countries like the Netherlands, Portugal, to be released in Russia, uh, Italy, and many other countries. So I'm very happy that people are interested in this story. And thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> you, you got it, no problem. And, and to the audience, uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you got a lot out of this. Pick up that book once it comes out on October 1st. But until next time, stay free, stay principled, and most importantly, stay ungovernable. <laughs>